Thank you, Fabio. I appreciate the introduction. <laughs> I want to thank the country of Uruguay and the organizing committee. Um, I believe so that the, the organizing committee has just done a tremendous job with this meeting, and it's really been a pleasure to, to be here and to talk to you this morning. I particularly want to thank my good friend, Dr. Montosi, um, who's very famous in his own right for the opportunity to come and, and speak to you about this topic. <laughs> I, I, it's difficult to follow Dr. Catlick on this, this program, and so I will try and stimulate you with some intellectual questions. Um, I've, I've struggled with the topic that Dr. Montosi assigned to me, um, probably because of my own inability to sort out the confusion that, that is associated with this topic. He asked me to speak about globalization of the meat industry versus the demand that is appearing around the world for local production. And so I'm going to start out the presentation and discuss with you the conventional production that we're, most of us are familiar with. And, and I'm going to start by asking the question, how many of you recognize a brand name logo that's represented on this slide? Does anybody recognize these brands? Many of you? How many of these brands, when you see them marketed, and some of them are marketed just upstairs in the hotel store, when you see that brand, do you know where they were produced? These are truly international companies. Their products are marketed around the world. In some cases, they're produced around the world. Example, BMW on the top right. We all know BMW is a high-quality automotive company based in Germany. Are all BMWs manufactured in Germany? Absolutely not. We have a very large BMW plant in South Carolina, in the United States. So this topic becomes difficult because you have to separate, as you ask the question, what constitutes a global company? Does that mean a company that sells products in a lot of places? Or does it mean that it's a company that manufactures products in a lot of places? As an example, I would like to talk a little bit about what is happening in livestock production. And again, this is conventional production. But I'm going to use pork genetics as my initial example. We conducted a study several years ago with the objective of evaluating the competitive disparities that may exist among pork producing countries. And so one of the things that we determined in that assessment, which was conducted in a number of countries that are large pork producers, is that genetics that are used in pork production are now all developed and marketed by global international genetics companies. And so really, as you go from pork producing nation to pork producing nation, the genetics that are used to develop the pigs in those countries are really very similar. Not exactly the same, but similar. When you look at this scenario, what you begin to see is that production is becoming standardized in some sense. We have standardized genetics for pork around the world. When I combine that with an alliance, a vertically aligned production system in which everything that is used, every process that is used to manufacture or produce the product is controlled by the ultimate processor, then you'll see that we really do have a standardized production system that's global. 
Now the question becomes is what is different about the production system, for example, on the slide versus some other company's branded production system? And that's where differentiation in the market occurs. So when you combine those two things, as I've made the argument, you really have very similar production or very similar products, I should say, being manufactured around the world, with the exception of the processes that perhaps are used to manufacture those products. So when you see something marketed that identifies an origin or a provenance for production, then you have to begin to wonder what really is different about this product. This beef product that's produced where I'm from in Colorado, is it different? Does it have attributes that make it better or worse? Or is it just different? These declarations of provenance become important because even though perhaps the genetics and even maybe the manufacturing system might have been similar to those used in other places, it's important that for some reason we still attach where it was produced to the product. So you're all familiar in the meat industry, most plants today that are pro producing conventional products have become certified to the Global Food Safety Initiative. This is for purposes of producing and controlling the safety of the products being generated. But interestingly enough, one of the items that is benchmarked under a, any GFSI standard, and the slide uses the British Retail Consortium as an example, requires that if you determine that you're going to label a provenance or an assured status that could be organic or natural, if you're going to put any of those claims on the label of a product, then you have to implement a control system to ensure the customer that you actually are selling them products that conform with that requirement. So that includes traceability, it includes segregation of all of the products throughout the manufacturing system, which includes raw materials and finished products. And so you have to maintain the segregation and the traceability to ensure customers that the product was actually produced at the, in the fashion that you've said that it was produced. So even though we produce something that may have been similar, similar genetics, similar production processes, we're going to put on the label that it was produced at a specific location or using that particular production system in question, now it's important to maintain traceability and differentiate the product. So as I've studied this, obviously I've become confused. One reference that I found that I really like was this publication recently by Sexton. And I like what he said. He said, as a profession, we have only begun to understand the implications of increasing product differentiation and vertical coordination among firms for market performance and distribution of benefits among the participants. And he listed three key trends that he sees occurring as this concept of globalization occurs. Firstly, is we have concentration at retail and processing. That's something that is not new. We've been seeing that in the United States since the 60s and 70s. But a couple other things that are interesting is we have product quality differentiation and what constitutes quality is shifting. When I was young, we would never have seen something marketed as a sustainable product, or as Dr. Catlick mentioned, a gluten-free product. So what is important to consumers relative to quality is shifting. And then lastly, there's this evolving vertical coordination and control controlling the process of production. Essentially, he sees this as a dramatic transformation 
resulting in consolidation and market domination by very large processing, trading, and retailing firms. So in the United States, this has become a hot button topic, very concerning to many people. They say, well, if we have these huge corporations evolving, what happens to the family farm? You guys are producing factory farmed products. That's got to be a bad thing. But in truth, the data in the United States don't support this. If you look at these data, either categorizing family as FAO categorizes a family, or as the USDA categorizes a family, you'll see that anywhere from 60 to as high as 90% of production, generally speaking, occurs by family-owned companies. So this is primary production. This is the farms and ranches that are producing the raw materials that are then, that then flow into the, the packing and processing sector. The other thing that's important and that has been controversial in the U.S. is that, and particularly in the beef cattle industry, is that farming is a way of life. So if I am a rancher in Colorado of the United States, it's important to me to have policies and practices in place that will protect the longevity of that way of living. In addition, at least in the U.S., that has become important because that has become a mechanism for transferring wealth from one generation to the next generation. And so this concept of protecting the way of life and our ability to transfer wealth has become very important and it will be defended exclusively by the people that are in agriculture for a long period of time. So then the question is, where does the globalization really begin? Well, some people have said that it is at the retail, the consumption interface level of the industry. I use Walmart as my example. All of you are probably familiar with Walmart. They employ 2.2 million people globally in the United States alone, 1.3 million people. That means if you visited the United States recently, one out of every 200 people that you meet or shake hands with works for Walmart. That's an astounding number, to me anyway. Approximately 35 million people shop at a Walmart every day around the world. If Walmart were a country they would have the 26th largest economy of any country in the world. They'll generate roughly $470 billion in revenue this year. Folks, that's a big company. Another one that most of you would be, would be knowledgeable about is McDonald's Corporation, starting as a single restaurant in Los Angeles Along with their franchisees, McDonald's now operates over 1. Point, uh, I'm sorry, over uh, 35,000 stores around the world, and they employ over 1.9 million people. Over 70 million people shop at a McDonald's every day. That's three times as many as shop at Walmart. That's a lot of folks. They operate in 119 countries around the world. And in the United States alone, they have about 25% of the food service market share. That's a big company. So if you contrast that back to the primary production information that I shared, one has to wonder, where is this globalization? Where is the, where is the interface between family farming and primary production and globalization actually occurring? The dictionary defines globalization as development of an increasingly integrated global economy. The term was first used in 1951. Probably in truth, and this was information that actually was provided during the review of the, the paper that I wrote for this presentation, 
Probably the first global company in the meat industry was Bestie Foods Group. They're probably most famous for operating the Blue Star freight shipping lines. But this was a family company that originated around the end of the 1800s. They developed butcher shops and retail outlets all over the United Kingdom, eventually over 3,000 of them. Because they didn't have the ability to produce all of the products that they sold in the United Kingdom, they began ranching and farming all over South America and in Australia. They opened packing plants and processing plants in Australia and in Argentina. And then they would ship the raw materials back on their ocean liners to the United Kingdom where they were then merchandised through their 3,000 outlet stores. Huge company, but globalized a long time ago. This concept of globalization, it's important that companies have access for their products. So if the Vesti Foods Group had not been able to export beef products, for example, that they manufactured in Argentina or in Brazil to the United Kingdom because there was some concern about a foreign animal disease or food safety issue, then that access limitation would have reduced their ability to move product through that system. That business model would have been less efficient. So one of the things that has improved our ability to, for companies to globalize has been increasing access to markets for different products. So part of this globalization issue has to be the ability to have free trade and to trade products and goods among countries. Not everybody is in agreement that that's a good thing. Probably one of the biggest downsides that we faced in the United States is a fraction of the population that is anti-trade. And so as a consequence, even when the WTO met in Seattle in the 1990s to begin the Doha round of the World Trade Organization Agreement, we experienced a number of riots and, a, and huge problems, civil unrest, associated with this concept of globalization. So if you're following along with me, you're starting to see some disparity in what perhaps a population wants versus the most efficient way to produce what the population wants. In truth, as globalization and efficiency in production and scales of economy improve, then the cost to the consumer to purchase food products is reduced. So in the United States, and clearly this is also dependent upon income levels, but we spend about 6% of all of our expenditures, all the money we spend, on food products. And then that goes all the way to Pakistan, which expends almost 50% of their expenses just to eat. And you can see that Uruguay and most of the South American countries are somewhere in between. Uruguay, in fact, Dr. Montosi, is about three times the percentage that we experience in the United States. So, one of the benefits of globalization and improved efficiencies that are result from scale of economies is to reduce the cost to the population of, of the food product. How much of that consolidation has occurred? Well, I'm going to use the U.S. as an example here. I think this is probably representative of what's happened around the world. But basically, Wayne Purcell was a very famous economist in the United States that's now retired. And he did some studies that showed the beef industry experienced unprecedented structural change during the 1980s. We went from four firm concentrations, so that's four company concentrations, 51% in 1979 to 79% in 1988 meaning that 
four firms controlled the market share of about 51% of the market in 1979 and 79% in 1988. That's obviously changed since then significantly. Today, the top four firms in the United States probably control somewhere in the neighborhood of 90 or 92 percent of the market share. If you look at what has happened, though, in terms of primary production, our cow-calf production system is down a bit, but has maintained relative constancy. It's mainly down now because of drought conditions that we've experienced. The number of feedlots have increased over time. So the main concentration has occurred in the packing sector. These are data that were published from Meat and Poultry magazine, which ranks the top 10 meat and poultry country companies every year. And you can see that the list of top 10 companies has changed significantly over the period of time from 1982 to 2014. And interestingly enough, if you'll look at the top five in some of those years, for example, 1991, several of those companies have actually merged to become a single com company. For example, IBP Inc. merging with Tyson Foods to become Tyson Foods. So this has been the fear of producers in the United States that we have this consolidation going among the companies that w operate in the United States without much concern really for the concentration that's actually occurring on a global scale. But if you look today, there's actually a large number, I've listed here I think about 18 companies that are truly global in terms of where they produce products and where they sell products obviously facilitated by access to markets. Even as I was preparing this talk, there's acquisitions occurring. The company WH Group that purchased Smithfield Foods in the United States, which was the largest pork producer in the world already, just recently bought two more companies in Australia. JBS, who I'll talk about more in a second, just purchased in the last three weeks three plants from Tyson and two companies in Brazil. So this hasn't slowed down. JBS is a good example, and I use them only as a single example because I work with them closely from time to time. But they started out as a single small company that didn't even own a slaughtering facility initially in the 1950s. If you look through what has happened, particularly in 2008 when they have purchased Australian Tasman Group, Australian Meat Holdings, Smithfield Foods Cattle Division, Five Rivers Cattle Feeding, and the Swift Group in the United States, they've become all of a sudden big. They're Walmart sized big now. They operate over 300 production facilities worldwide. They market over 40 brands. They slaughter 100,000 head of cattle a day, 70,000 pigs a day, 12 million chickens a day, and 25,000 lambs a day. I guess they'll be working on increasing their lamb slaughter volume. And they just recently, as I mentioned, bought more plants. So today, they're the largest protein producer in the world. And they'll do about 50 to $60 billion worth of business this year. So the question becomes, this appears to be the trend for how conventional production is occurring. It reduces costs. Therefore, making product move in greater volumes to a greater number of consumers. And the question becomes is, is this what consumers actually prefer on a mine run basis? 
What we're experiencing in the United States and what I believe you're experiencing in most countries of the world is now this demand for local production. Consumers feel good about products that they know were produced in their mind locally. This has went as far in the United States as us developing a mandatory law in which we have to label meat and poultry products on the retail label with the country of origin. We started this process out and then several countries took us to WTO court and we lost and so we've recently modified our regulations concerning country of origin labeling. But the fact of the matter is, is that we're doing it not because the pork is necessarily different in Denmark than it is in the United States, but it's because of this developing need on the part of consumers to know where their food came from and how it was raised. I think that, and this is purely speculation, but I think that this is partly due to fear in consumers. There's been a lot of media that consumers have greater access to concerning crises that have occurred in the meat and livestock industry. Like E. coli 0157H7 and BSE. And then when you combine that, at least in the United States, with other things that consumers feel they were lied to about, like tobacco, asbestos, and other things that cause you to die, then th they don't have a very good feeling about having confidence in what they're purchasing. And so they want to know more about it. Just a recent study uh, that's conducted every couple of years by a marketing group in the United States clearly demonstrates that 24% of consumers don't know anything, I'm sorry, only 24% have good knowledge about agricultural production and how it's marketed and processed. That means 75% of the consumers in the United States don't know anything about how, your, how their food's produced. Therefore, they're easily scared by it. And even though this number has improved since 2012, they don't feel like the food industry is transparent in how we define for them how our, their food is produced. And so their trust is not very good because of the fear factor. And if you look along the bottom of this slide, you'll see all of the things that have evolved that they're afraid of. And these are all the technologies that we talked about earlier that improve efficiency and reduce cost of production and make more product available to more people. What this has resulted in in the United States is a new culture. Consumers wanting to be more engaged again in what they eat. Food has become part of their life. I can't describe it adequately enough. It's, it's part of their being. And so we have entire TV stations dedicated to food. We have the evolving concept of being able to talk to the people that produced our food. We have competitions in food preparation. We completed a study every five years called the National Beef Quality Audit. And this last study was conducted in 2011. We asked people in, during the study, what is most important to you? What must you have before you will buy the product? Versus what things are you willing to pay more for? And Clearly, out of those data, which are quantified as willingness to pay data, the thing that is most likely to be required by people that purchase and sell products directly to consumers is where and how were cattle raised and where did it come from. In fact, the number one weakness of the beef industry in our last quality audit was why are we not doing a good job telling our story? Why are we not transparent enough? Even as recently as this summer, at the Food Marketing Institute's meeting, 
There was a presentation that demonstrated clearly that there's a shifting pattern of consumption and a shifting demand for differing types of attributes in products by consumers, at least in the United States. Organic beef demand has increased 219% in the last two years. Now that's still not very much of our production, but demand is obviously growing. In this presentation, the author said the most obvious trend and the one that will be around for the long haul is the concept of having access to locally produced foods. In fact, in the study that is conducted every year called the power of meat in the United States by retail supermarkets, they found that 42% of the consumers in the United States were interested in purchasing locally sourced meat products, whatever that means. Organic food production and demand for organic foods is growing. And even though most of this demand has been in produce, we're starting to see growth in meat and poultry demand as well. So what consumers are looking for, we believe, is they want to know the story of how their food was produced. We call it storied meat. They want to have a picture of the guy that raised their livestock and that produced their food next to the food that when they purchase it. This now becomes part of them and they feel good about it. So as a consequence, we have this phenomenon occurring called farmer's markets. 20 years ago, we called these wet markets. Farmer's markets are where consumers can go to a local community area and purchase food products directly from the growers of those food products. It's a direct marketing channel. And just look at the growth in the number of these types of markets that have occurred in the past 20 years. Farmers now have the ability to directly sell products to the consumer, but very few of these are actually having success in selling meat and poultry products to consumers. Nonetheless, I believe that with some additional assurances, this is something that's going to grow as a trend, at least in the United States. 71% of farmers that have marketed products directly through farmers markets in the U.S. have reported greater profits for those that primary production than if they had sold to packing and processing entities. These farmers markets are the keystones for building a food system that is locally based. It's a concept, it's a philosophical value-based thing. It encourages diversity of production, it encourages differences in manufacturing characteristics and procedures, and it leads to interaction among the producers and the consumers. This has become so popular that even now we have mobile farmers markets. This is one that was recently reported on. They put a farmers market on a truck and they send it to downtown Chicago to sell products. So this local demand phenomena has become popular with a large share of consumers and so the question becomes is how do the globalized companies try to capitalize on this? And so here's one example of what research has showed the trend to be. These are large supermarket chains in Asia that have developed systems for procuring the products that they sell at retail from local producers so that then they can be marketed in their stores as local production. 
The buyer needs to be wary in these types of systems. These are pictures that I took from a auction area in Vietnam a couple of years ago because there's two problems that may arise in these markets. Firstly, the products may not always be exactly what they're portrayed to be for consumers. And so I can envision additional regulatory oversight occurring as this trend continues. And secondly, we still have food safety and hygienic considerations to worry about in some of these markets. These are actually retro markets if you look at how food has been marketed historically. One thing that is reasonably new and entrepreneurial, in my opinion, is this concept of co-production or community-supported agriculture chains. These are farming operations in which the consumer becomes more engaged and a part of the production system. There are several business formats that are being used in these systems. The first being that a consumer just buys a share of the production system and then they receive the products at the end of the production cycle. The other being where the consumer actually purchases a share and then has to work on producing the product before they receive the product at the end of the production cycle. They don't know what local means yet. Some people talk about food miles as reflecting locality of production. But in point of fact, it's not so much about how far away food was produced for consumers, it's about the consumers having attachment to the people that produced it. I give you the Japanese marketing system. These are pictures that I took a few years ago, and so they're probably outdated technology at this point. But you see that the ear tags go into the cattle at the time of the primary production, and then those ear tags have unique barcodes and identifications that travel with the, the animal and the product as they move through the system. And ultimately, you can go into a retail grocery store and scan the barcode, and you can get a printout, or you can get it on your iPhone, the printout that's in the center of that screen. That printout looks something like this. It has who produced the product, who fed it, what was it fed, what pharmaceuticals were, treat, were the animals treated with, where was it slaughtered, where was it processed, everything you ever wanted to know about it. I asked the guy, the CEO of the company that has this system in place, Jusco Foods, how many people actually use this system? How many of your consumers use this system? And he said, nobody. He said, only you meet science types that want to see how it works come in and actually use it. So he said, for us, it's more about us having the system available than it is about them actually needing to use it. So that's been employed in this concept of community agriculture. It's important to, con to consider that most populations today are urban, and so if you want to engage them in the production system, you have to create areas for them to be engaged in. These different CSA formats are numerous, the thing I want to point out for you on this slide is the rate at which growth is occurring in this marketing mechanism in the United States. There's as many as 35,000 consumers purchasing their entire food supply through these systems, and the number of these operations are growing quickly. It's been a pleasure to talk with you this morning. I probably have confused you as much as I have confused myself, but I really appreciate Dr. Montosi the opportunity to be here and happy to answer some questions and give you my opinions on this topic if you choose. Thank you.